Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA slate for tomorrow. Uh, first of all, um, because it is in Paris, you're getting a noon Eastern time uh, post time for the first fight. Um, I happen to appreciate that. It doesn't go until three in the morning. I actually watch uh, a couple of fights before I have to leave for the evening. Um, I have to say this, there's a whole bunch of fishiness involved in this slate involved in this card and we'll, we'll go through it it's one of the weirder cards there is now just a little bit of background anybody cares this is the first time they've had a ufc card in paris um, it took a long time for them to even uh, declare it legal so um they're they're you know the country and the, and the department out there is really looking forward to this and there, there's a lot of narratives and there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes here. We'll, we'll talk about that. But first of all, I mean, this should go without saying, I guess, um, that if, if you're betting on or if you're counting on somebody to get a decision in Paris and you're going against a French fighter, um, you're, you're just not allowed to complain if it doesn't go your way. That's just the way it is. Now, I've heard some some talk about the judging is actually supposed to be pretty good out there, but it, it's, I mean, I, I was born yesterday. You know what I mean? I wasn't born. Uh, what's what, what was I wasn't born yesterday, but I was born today or something like that. I've just, I've just seen a lot and look, all else being equal. I'm just going to be presuming um, that anything close is going to go to the French. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, but there's other kind of sub narratives to, to talk about as we go through this. They really wanted to put this card together and there were some fights that dropped out. And to make this card work, they put some fights together that involved an incredible amount of fishiness. Um, and listen, I'm not exactly sure which way the odds are, are mis, uh, mispriced on some of these, but there's just no way some of these fights are priced efficiently. There's just not, um, just way too much fishiness involved here. So we will, uh, we will get to that. The other thing is that keep this in mind, and I, I kind of identified this three or four weeks ago, that you know when we play DFS MMA, we really look for those fighters with grappling upside, and that you always have these these battles between striker and, and grappler, and we talk about win condition about you know if this if the grappler is going to win. Uh, it's going to be you know better for 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 DraftKings scoring uh, in a decision than if the striker wins. Um, I'm going to pause this a second. Sorry about that. Um, now I forgot what I was saying. Uh, in any case, um, right, the grapplers versus uh, strikers. What I've noticed in the last basically month is that. In these striker versus grappler matchups, the grappler just never wins. I mean, it's it's uh, we, I can go through detail after detail and fight after fight, but when you have a close fight between a striker and a grappler, these style matchups have just really been been awful for the grappler. You know, and we talk about win condition, and we say, okay, you know, if he wins or if she wins, it's probably because she was able to get those takedowns or whatever, but. It just doesn't seem to have been working, you know, uh, and part of that is, well, the referees and the judges have really been rewarding the strikers for openers. They, they feel as though that the remember, they're not interested in DFS scores. They just they're just judging the fight and they're starting to feel as though getting good significant strikes. And is just more important than getting takedowns that you really don't do anything with, you know, remember in DFS scoring takedowns followed by you know kind of blanketing and control time you know adds up but in in actual mma judging it's it's really not been uh in, in favor so keep that in mind that that close decisions are 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 going the striker's way and that's 30 points right and the other thing to think about is that when you have a fighter who you think you think should go for takedowns and they don't it's not as easy to say, well, they were stupid. Remember, they they and their trainers and their camps see what I just saw, that that, that the referees and the, excuse me, and the judges are not really rewarding that type of style. So why would you 
adapt a style that is not really looked upon favorably right now. So, so it, it really throws an interesting twist into, into the analysis of these things. It's not so easy just to say, well, this guy, if he wins, it's going to be because he wrestled and got takedowns or whatever it is. It's not that easy because it, I think it's become less likely they, that they adopt that game plan for fear of losing a decision. And I feel as though that even if they do adopt that game plan, their 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 decision rate is is not going to be as high as people might think. So uh, that's that's something very interesting to consider as we go through these because still these grapplers are are owned more than the strikers. I mean, you'd think for good reasons because they score well when they win, but but it just doesn't seem as though they're being they're getting the wins, and it doesn't seem as though that these people are going for the takedowns as much as you would think they would for fear of not getting the, the decision. So I think that's a really important, important point. Um, let, let, let's, we might end up taking a little while with this, but that's okay. We're going to go fight by fight because there's a, a great array of fishiness involved in, in most of these. Um, just let me pause for just a second. So this first fight, uh, Stephanie Edgar versus Aline Perez. So this is, First example of, of of one of the one of the fishy themes of, of the card, and that a couple of fighters that were brought in on short notice um, to fill this card. A lot of fighters kind of dropped out, and fights dropped out. So a lot of this card was actually put together with kind of a you know <laughs> with major patchwork because listen, they've been waiting to do this for a long time, um, and to cut to take a fight on short notice is tough, and to take the, a fight all the way in Europe on short notice is, is, is extra tough. So this is, this is the first one. So you had Aline Perez, who is, who is essentially trying to be showcased against somebody awful. She was a, she was a big favorite, but, but her opponent dropped out. And so they found Stephanie Egger um, to come in on short notice to take this fight. And, and Stephanie Egger is, is basically a three, you know, two and a half, three to one favorite. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on with this fight because on the one hand, it's pretty tough to take a fight on short notice. And Egger also just fought within the last month, I think. Um, so short notice and coming off of, of a fight in a month, it's asking a decent amount. And to come to Europe on short notice is, is, is asking a lot as well. However, a couple of things. She didn't, it wasn't like that big of a deal how she fought in the past month because she was, she only made it through half the round. So, you know, she basically took Mary uh, Bueno Silva down and was pounding on her and then got caught in a submission out of nowhere, pretty much. And there was controversy whether she even tapped or not. But even presuming she did, um, you know, that wasn't even a fight. You know, it was just uh, so not too worried about that. Um, and Aline Perez was preparing to beat the crap out of someone. And now she's probably going to get the crap, crap beat out of her. So this is very interesting. So first of all, uh, this fight, Perez, excuse me, Edgar is a 9,300 price tag, um, which is kind of tough to get to. And normally with a woman's fight, however, the fight doesn't go to the decision line is pretty, is pretty decent. I mean, she's inside the distance plus 120 for a woman's fight. That's pretty good. Plus, plus the fact that she has the takedown upside. Um, I think the combination of those two things makes her a very strong play, you know, um, she gets one or two trip takedowns and ground and pound. And I've seen her. She can be very aggressive when she gets those takedowns about going for the ground and pound, which is that kind of score really adds up. Um, so I do feel as though she is a very, very strong play coming right out of the gate. Um, uh, when it comes to punt plays, Perez is, is, is actually pretty cheap relative to her price. I mean, she's, only plus 200 and she is what 9600 on the board or 99 or 6900 on the board that's pretty reasonable if you want to know the truth um look knowing what i saw i don't know if i can do it i mean like i've seen edgar fight and i've seen her and she just she gets those takedowns she'll beat on people and perez apparently has had just atrocious competition um so I don't know if I can do it, but based on the numbers, I mean, 
who's to say that Perez doesn't get some, I mean, that Edgar doesn't fall into one of those submissions again. I don't know. I, I do think that Edgar is the side here. I, I think that I have to go through a bunch of lineups to get to Perez, but listen, it's not like a lock. I mean, it is off of, of short notice, come fly, you know, coming or, or going over to Europe. But I think she's, uh, you know, one of the very, one of the strong plays on the site. Right, uh, Khalid Taha versus uh, Christine Kinoka, Quinones. Um, this doesn't show up as, as in the metrics as being really worth it. You know, you have fight doesn't go to decision line of, I don't know, Taha winning inside of this a plus 300. I mean, at 82, 8,300, I guess that's fine. And I mean, it's, it's okay to make the, to make the rest of your lineups work. But you think about it, I mean, less than remember minus plus 300 means that what 25, you know, 80% of the time, almost he doesn't finish inside the distance. And that's, that's pretty poor, even at 8,300. So I have seen a couple of takes that Tom might be an interesting play, but I don't know. It's tough. It's tough. And Quinones, unfortunately, just has no metrics at all. I mean, he's he he's a striker from the outside. Um, there's his inside the distance prop is ex- exceptionally poor. And he's um plus he's plus actually he's plus the three thirty. It's not that much worse, I I guess, than Taha. I think both these fighters are probably probably fades. Um, so I, I'd probably try to avoid this fight. Then you get to this one, uh, Santini versus Miranda. So you have Miranda, who's being brought in. I mean, from some with some terrible competition, and 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 Saint Denis is French, and he's minus three to one, and he's aggressive, and it's one of those situations where where both fighters are going to get what they want. Like Miranda's going to try to get this fight to the mat because he's a submission guy, and Saint Denis wants to get it to the mat too because he wants to pound on him. And I have a feeling that that. St. Denis could score 130 points uh, in this fight. Um, I feel as though Miranda, this is his only path to victory, is trying to get scrappy on the mat and maybe get a sub. I've just seen this all too often where what ends up happening is that the other guy just ends up on top pounding away. And from a DraftKings perspective, you almost rather it not finish in the first round, you know, because you can even get to the second round, get another takedown and more ground and pound. It could be a, it could be a crusher. So I, I think that Danny is just clearly the best play on the board. Um, biggest, I mean, he's one of the bigger favorites. The the inside the distance prop is extremely strong. You have inside the distance minus 135. But not to mention the inside distance minus 135. I mean, you get takedowns and you get ground and pound. It's the holy trinity. You know what I mean? You got KO upside, you get ground and pound upside, you got takedown upside. I mean, to me, I mean, this is this is probably the chalk you have to eat. I mean, and he's going to be really popular. I can't imagine him not being the most popular fighter on the slate. But um, I think this is the chalk you have to eat over the Cyril Gone chalk. Uh, I think this is just whatever. And with respect to Miranda, I mean, you look at his inside the distance prop, and it's, you know, it's not bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's plus 400 to win by submission. And considering he's probably going to go for it in the first round or so, I mean, 20% of the time he's going to get a first round sub. Is that what we're supposed to imply? I mean, at 7,100 or 7K, whatever it is, 7,100, 20% of the time he's optimal. Um, Yeah, I guess. Um, And you also get leverage on all of the St. Denis uh, money. So depending on how many lineups you play, I think that he's a very legitimate legitimate pivot a pivot legitimate leverage play i think he's a legitimate equity play um he's not going to do it all too often maybe again about 20 percent of the time but i will say this you get miranda that i I don't i really don't see him winning a anything past the first round. you know what i mean um maybe the second but this is like kind of weird you know he's plus 220 to win and he's wait, wait hold on so he's plus 220 to win and plus he's plus 400 by the submissions. Almost all of his wins are by submission. Um, so it's, um, I think he's his live, you know, I, I, I certainly prefer the Santini side. I think his, I mean, I really think he can score 130 points. 
I really do. Um, but Miranda's certainly live here. All right, so Buckley against Imamov. Um, these are two guys that we've seen before. There's not a lot of French fishiness here. Imamov is actually, I think, technically from France, maybe, uh, or he's training out of France or whatever. So, I mean, I'm not expecting Buckley to get any kind of decision here. I don't think he would get it anyway. I think if he got the decision, it would be from K, from from KO. But I will say this: I mean, Buckley does have kind of some sneaky wrestling, maybe. But but it's like I said: I mean, like you you play Buckley, he maybe gets some takedowns, but he loses on the feet. He's just not going to get the decision, and it's just you know unless he really clearly beats him. So it's kind of tough, and you're setting yourself up for a lot of frustration if you go with that route. However, I mean, I will say that Buckley wins by KO is plus 400. That's an extra 20%. Um, and that's fair, right? So I feel as though he's no worse of a play than Miranda. So I, I definitely think Buckley's live here. With respect to Imamov, I mean, him winning inside the distance plus 120, they're all, it's all pretty much the same. Like, there's a bunch of these around pick him guys. Um, so yeah, he's fair at 9,100. I got no problem with that. So this is a, it's a fight you probably want to target here. Um, the Imamov Buckley fight. All right. So Farazim against Big Lack. This is, this is a little more French fishiness. So, so Farazim got cut. Okay. And because Big Lack's opponent, I believe dropped out, they had to bring somebody in. So they rehired him so that we could, again, make this kind of slate work. Um, I mean, this seems like a bunch of misery for him. You know what I mean? Like, Felix, he's the, he's the contender. He's the 8 no guy or whatever it is. He's the guy with the with all the hype coming up, you know, with the big athletic build and probably going to have him be more active in many ways. And, and ZM is completely inactive. Um, so I – imagine that Figlock is is the side here um i mean we'll take a look at the ko upside there's not a lot of that um plus 500 twin by tko big like inside of this plus 330 that's pretty poor actually does have some takedown upside maybe so i i guess i think zeom i will definitely have zero and Figlock. what makes it work is the price so i'll put him in my pool um, but I think the, the point to be drawn from this is that Ziam just is no, I mean, I just think this is no good for him. Um, the combination of, of low volume probably shouldn't have been in the, in the, in the UFC anymore. Anyway, I think this is a, a bad spot for him. Um, okay. Magomedov against Stolfoots. Okay. So here's a good example. Um, let's look at the inside the distance prop first um, for Magomedov inside the distance, same as these others, like pick them, whatever it is, plus one twenty, same, same stuff. Right. Um, he can win by KO submission, whatever it is. And, and, and you have Stolfus who's, he just got a win over Dwight Grant by, by utilizing his takedown. So this is what you do, right? You say, okay, uh, Stolfus, his path to victory is going to be via takedowns. He's plus two to one favorite uh, underdog. So about 33% of the time he's going to win. And when he wins, it's going to be by takedown. So takedowns score a lot. And as a, as a result, um, he's a, probably a good play at 7,100 or 7,300, whatever he is. But this is, a, this is a problem. Okay. Because as I mentioned, you know, this is, this is this striker versus um, grappler thing. Is 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 has been bad for the Raptors. You know, Stolfitz could get a couple of takedowns here, but Maga Ma, Ma, is such a has such an edge on the feet with getting the strikes and stuff that you might get everything you want out of Stolfitz and just still lose. You know, so I think it's a very I think it's I think Stolfus is a bad play. I wouldn't play him as an underdog here. Um, I much prefer Buckley with some KO upside, you know, or Miranda with some submission upside than to play a Stolpitz just because he's got the takedown upside. There's just too many variations where he gets the takedowns and he loses anyway, you know. And who's to say that, that Magomedov is not can not do takedowns either? He's been gone. He's been away for like a year and a half, which is part of the French fishiness of this, of this card. 
So he's not a lock or anything like that. But I think I think the lesson to be drawn from this is I think that, that Stolfus is just not someone you want to put in your underdog pool. I think I think that's kind of a sucker bet there. It's another one of these bet grapplers. You're just he's just not going to win, you know. And if you, and, and and you know if, again, his win condition is not necessarily going to be tied to him winning. You know, he get the break, he get the takedowns, but still not win. Um. So Magomedov, I you know. I think he's very reasonable at 8,800. Um, he's got KO upside and all that stuff. Awful year and a half is concerning, but I think he's perfectly reasonable. All right, so here's a fight which is going to gain or garner a lot of ownership. So you have Jordan or Jordan or whatever against Nathaniel Wood. And this is the reason why this is garnering ownership Number one, because of the price. And number two, it's not necessarily because of the inside distance prop. Because you look at the inside dis the distance prop, and it's really not that great. You have, I mean, it's okay. You have Jordan is plus 180, and Wood is worse. He's plus one plus 400. I mean, overall, fight doesn't go. It's only about a pick, right? So it's not exactly the greatest. But the thing is that that both these guys do throw a lot of volume, okay? So so these 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 significant strikes can add up in a fight like this. And in addition to that, you're going to get a, some ownership on the wood side because wood, in addition to throwing a lot of volume also does have some grappling and takedown upside. So, and you combine that with the fact that Jordan is actually very poor at defending takedowns. It creates a win condition for, um, for him, for wood that overcomes his lack of an inside the distance problem. So both of these guys you can make good cases for. But again, I, I would caution you before playing too much of Wood. And Wood's going to be, I think, pretty popular at 7,800 here. Don't be surprised, right? If you play Wood, he gets takedowns, but he just gets outstruck, and then you complain about a bad decision, okay? It's very possible. Now, that doesn't really help Jordan um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the DFS community because, you know, if he does get taken down, and it goes to a decision and he wins, he's not going to have enough time to rack up those non-KO points, right? So I think this fight could bust, you know, um, as, a, as a popular fight to target. So I think in GPPs, I think you want to try to you know, underweight on this fight, okay, um, for all the reasons that I just mentioned. So this next fight is, is, is just legit like French fishiness. Okay. Like they, they needed to get this fight on, get a fight on the card. They had two completely different fighters, I think fighting this and they ended up putting these two guys in and you think about it, you have two guys that no one's ever heard of that, that are being put on this card and they weren't originally scheduled to be on the card. It's probably because they <laughs> that good, you know, they've been waiting for this to be in France for so long. And then they, they, they only at the last minute invited this Gomi dude to, to freaking go fight. I mean, come on. I mean, now he's coming up as a two to one favorite. I I can't imagine that this is the right line. Unfortunately, I don't know which way it's wrong. You know what I mean? But how how are people how are they gonna really put a good line out on this? You have two ties that have never I mean, this gets like two guys are just no idea. Really. I mean, people look at tape or whatever it is, but but the fact is is that this is a this is a hopeless fight to to attempt to handicap. Look, if if you believe what what what's come, what's out here, okay. So, Gomi's a minus two to one, which is like some of these other guys. His inside the distance prop is, um, is is decent, right? Uh, inside the distance is plus one twenty. Same as these others. And if you believe what you hear, I mean, he does have some takedown upside. So sure, in GPPs you kind of have to play him. But and and the thing is, I would I would take a shot at Aaron's just just for variance, right? except for the fact that from what I've heard, he's just a pure striker and I'm just with no KO upside. So, so for me, I don't know. It's, I know it's fishy. I know the line is fishy and it look in, in, in another world. Like I might play errands like in a, just for um, whatchamacallit, maybe in a betting line, I'll, I'll play errands because again, you know, if Gomi is in fact, it's going to be only for takedowns and, and what's his name? Errands is in fact the striker. Again, I think the, the, the decisions have been favoring, the, been favoring the strikers. However, it's in France. So how are you going to beat a win in France against a French? It's just not happening. So I think I think the fight is probably 
I guess either go me or pass, I suppose. Um, but it's definitely fishy. All right, so hack parast against Medesi. So this is one thing I'm not doing. I'm not going to be playing Medesi, and this is this is this is the steam that I've heard. I mean, really, over the last couple of days. I mean, it seems as though Medesi is getting getting all kinds of ownership. Um, for a number of reasons. I mean, number one, Hackbarass has just been really disappointing um, for, you know, several fights. And McDessie's been posting on Instagram that he wants to take Hackbarass's head off and, and this whole thing, and he's going to be out really aggressive. But, I mean, at this point, we do have to look at the numbers here. The fight doesn't go to a decision. It's a plus 120. Um, and you have McDessie winning by TKO. It's plus 650. I mean, no thanks. You know, I, look, if you play McDessie, you know, you're spotting 10 years of youth to hack press. I mean, you, you don't win like that in MMA. So I'm not doing that. And unfortunately, hack press, I mean, just with a, these 8,800 or 8,900 with a, with a, with a fight doesn't go to decision line so poor. I mean, you just can't play it, you know? So he's got, I guess, going to be a fade. And I guess this whole fight's going to be a fade. All right. Um, Okay, Kapilov against DiCherico. Um, The good thing about this fight is that's an 8K fight. I mean, 8,100, 8,300, whatever it is. The fight doesn't go to the decision line is not that bad, okay? And, and the reason why I bring that up is, listen, I've, I've been looking at, at, at content like kind of all week. And the one thing that I have seen as a complete consensus is that this fight is going to be low action and low volume and boring, okay? And most content providers are fading this. Now, if that is the case, I mean, why is the fight doesn't go decision line like almost a pick? You know what I mean? Like this is the price range where if you get a finish, it really does you wonders for your lineups. And it's not as if they're like a plus 300 to finish. So if you want a GPP play, I'd play this fight, okay? And if you really want a GPP play, you'll play the copy left side. Because if anything, what you're hearing is that DiCherico might have some wrestling upside, maybe. So that's why if people are saying, if anything, I'm going to play the, the DiCherico side. But I don't know. I think copy love is going to be low owned at, at, at a decent at, at a good price and an inside the distance prop that I think is, is just undervalued relative to their ownership. Okay. You have copy love winning by in the distance is plus three thirty, which is, I mean, not the greatest, but at this, at his ownership at that price, I think, I think it's worth it. So I think that's going to, this, I think this is going to be kind of my, my GP plea kind of hoodoo here is maybe copy love. Somehow, I mean, he is favored, right? Um, and maybe uh, actually, it's better stone pick him, right? And who knows? You know, it, it's it, like I said, it's not, it's not plus one, plus three hundred to finish. It's pick him. I think that this is a fight you probably want to target actually, um, because it's going to be low owned relative to some of these others. All right, so now you have Whitaker against Vittori, and here's here's another one. Listen, if this were this were another another part of my of, of my life. You know what I would do here? I would just take Whitaker in GPPs because there's literally there's there's two things that I've heard during the week. Either Vittori is in a really, really good underdog, or Whitaker is an incredibly good favorite that's just not gonna score well. Okay. Um, I've heard that Whitaker is just going to piece him up. Listen, the people that are betting Whitaker are saying that that he's just too good on the feet. Uh, he's going to just pick Vittori apart and win a decision. And 8,800 is probably not going to be good enough to, to take make that work. People that are actually into Vittori, they're looking at other underdogs. They don't really like them. They say, listen, Vittori is like young. He's coming up. He's 20. You know, he's, he's he gets some takedowns. He, uh, he can't be knocked out. Um, and he's a very live underdog. And I'll tell you that you're going to get Whitaker at 15% ownership. I mean, I will say this, there's a lot of leverage you're going to get on all these 8,800s. 
if 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 you get lucky here and maybe Whitaker just pieces him up so bad that he just gets a KO. Ma- imagine that. Imagine if Whitaker gets a first round KO. I was gonna say that that imagine what that does to everybody's lines, whatever. Because th- this is gonna, he's gonna, this is gonna be the second to last fight, right? Nobody is going to. I'm telling you, nobody is going to be at this alive going to his last two fights rooting for Whitaker for KO. Everybody is going to be either waiting for the Vittori underdog play to come in or for Whitaker to just, you know, just let Whitaker win, but let him just get a decision. You know what I mean? Whatever. And I don't know. I, I'm, I, I hate to say this, but I'm going to be over on this. I, I just am. Um, you know, Whitaker back in the day, he used to actually be a wrestler himself, you know, who knows? Um, I feel as though that the Whitaker play is really the GPP kind of galaxy brain play of the week. And and you think it's stupid, right? I mean, like, why, why is this the galaxy brain, brain play, uh, galaxy brain play of the week? He's, he's probably the most well-known guy on the whole card. I mean, but I'm telling you, he's going to be very low owned and he's going to be lower, low owned relative to his win odds. And he's low owned. he would be exceptionally low owned by the sharp players. Cause I haven't found a single one. Play. So what you're, what I'm saying is, is that if you do get away with playing Whitaker and he wins, you're not going to be competing with a lot of sharp lineups, okay? <laughs> Which is good. So, so I think you get extra leverage and extra good stuff there. Not to mention you'll, you'll, you know, every I'm telling you, every sharp player in the world is going to be playing Victoria. They would start. Um, so uh, I think Whitaker is a very, very sneaky GPP play. Um, so now we're at Gon and Tuivasa. And I'll say I'll say this I'll, I'll say the same thing you know I haven't I haven't seen a lot of love for for Gon at ninety five hundred um because that's what I've heard right he's gonna piece him up he's technically strong but he's not a killer he's not gonna go for it in the first round Tui Boss is tough and he's not gonna be able to pay off the ninety five hundred I see his ownership at fifty percent I I I think it's gonna be lower um. And in a weird, weird way, I don't think that they're going to be. Listen, if you want to play, you want to play GPPs, right? You know, you're going to have people playing the Saint Denis, probably a really strong player, right? You're going to have some people playing Edgar. You're going to have this this mid range stuff. I mean, this is really weird. But if you play Gone and Whitaker, I'm telling you, no, it's, that combination in in deep field GPPs is not going to be that common. Okay, because of all these other options. So, uh, it's look, it's he is minus six hundred. I mean, he's gonna win, right? I shouldn't, you know, he's, not, he's gonna win. And who knows? Maybe, maybe God goes for takedowns. Maybe he pieces him up and knocks him out in the first round. Maybe God's heard all this crap about him. He can't finish anybody. Listen, he blew it against freaking what's his name against the Ghana. I mean, he's been waiting to to take somebody out. I mean, I don't know, man. Maybe, maybe the I I think that I think that God is probably the biggest lock to get 100 uh, points of all the guys we talked about. And that's just the bottom line, you know? Um, that's not the bottom line, because he's 9,500. But um, uh, I think Tui Vasa, obviously, he's got a puncher's chance. Probably, you know, he's plus 400, so it's 20%. I presume that 20% of the time he gets a KO, right? I don't think he's going to win a decision. So I think that's reasonable. Play some Tui Vasa also, just in case. But... Um, I'm not going to be walking over anybody to, to do that. So as I said, and gone is no, another reason Tui Vasa is not you know winning by decision is because it's in France. <laughs> so um, I, I think it is kind of a cool card with a lot of fishiness, though. Um, I think if I had to rank these guys, I mean, just as far as their overall play, I, look, St. Denis, I still think is the best play. Um and gone, I think, is a good play too. But but Denis, gone. I think Edgar is pretty good. There's a bunch of good fades here, but but I, I boy, I, I want to play this Kopulov thing to kind of get different. But I kind of want to play this, this Whitaker weirdly to get different and take some shots on these under other underdogs like Buckley. Um, maybe fade is your Don fight, you know. Um, so I don't know, very, very tough card. Um, expect anything (laughs) really, 
And uh, I do think if somebody takes this down, by the way, by themselves, I think it's a very, very tough card to get off the mold. A um, lot of different things to happen, even in a 12 fight card. Uh, so that'll do it. Good luck, everybody. And remember, 12 uh, noon post time.